where you are now and what we can do to fix it is the most important thing. And just knowing that there is an option to get better with the assistance of somebody or on your own just means the world. Welcome to the most exciting adventure of your life. Welcome to a new way of living. Welcome to the Five Mountain Adventures podcast, where we discuss the five mountains of cutting edge human development, physical, mental, emotional, intuition, and spirit. Hi, I'm Casey. And I'm Andy. And we help people get unstuck and thrive in challenging times. Our goal for this year is to help 5,000 people thrive in these challenging times via our podcast and mental fitness one-on-one and small group coaching. You can help us raise, or you can help us reach our goal by rating and sharing our podcast and following us on Instagram and YouTube. Help us raise the vibration of our world, moving from anger, fear, and division to courage, understanding, and compassion. It starts with us. Today, we are speaking with Dr. James Leonetti. He's an award-winning chiropractor and clinic director of Enlivened Wellness. His passion is to improve the lives of clients ready to make the change, whether that is from sick to normal or into an optimal state. Over his career, he studied many approaches to healthcare and developed a brain-based approach to improving the body and mind. He's worked in many aspects of healthcare, from an investigator with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, research assistant, medical laboratory technologist, occupational hygienist, acupuncturist, and as a practicing chiropractic physician for over 15 years. He's been mentored by an amazing collection of individuals and has a strong desire to bring their knowledge, skills, and philosophy to assisting others in their health goals. Welcome, Dr. James Leonetti. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this. Us too. And, you know, we always like to find out what is piquing your curiosity right now in your life. Oh, so right now I'm really fascinated by where the mind and the soul meet the body and the neurology. So looking at that interface, it's it's a very complex area and there's a lot of dynamics and, you know, looking at it from a, a bottom up or a, a top down approach really gives you some good insight on that. Oh, I love that. What an interesting topic too, just to dive into. Yeah, gosh, we'd love to uh, to, to talk about that at some point too. If not today, then maybe sometime in the future, because that isn't just intriguing to me. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's my area of study right now. You know, I have I have a lot of work on the um, the body and the and the neurology systems, and you know, recently I've been really getting into the the higher level consciousness and and learning about that. And taking it, um, you know, we use meditation as a gateway for it that we can also use to repair uh, body systems. But, you know, even taking that deeper dive and, you know, what are we, who are we, and how do we make ourselves complete as a, as a being? We also like to hear, you know, kind of origin stories, where you came from, how you got to, you know, studying this type of work, if you wouldn't mind sharing how you got to the path you're on today. Yeah, so uh, I went, you know, went to college nearby, um, got a degree of medical technology. I got a master's in occupational hygiene and safety. I was fortunate enough that was uh, paid for by research and inspection experience working for workers' compensation. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, and I was ready there that had inspection experience, had the medical experience and FDA uh, grabbed me as a counterterrorism hire. So it was it was a fascinating field. I was stationed in Baltimore. Um, I really, really got into one of my loves, which is medical devices. So, you know, at some time we can talk about biometrics, but like I love medical devices and uh, I was fortunate enough that I was able to travel uh, in the mid-Atlantic area. And then later on, I got an international um, position. So I looked at medical devices throughout the entire world on top of blood banks and pharmaceutical manufacturers and food manufacturers and, and chemical manufacturers. Um, but when I had that job, I got transferred to a, a field office and it was a small post. There were two of us there and it was long days of driving going out, doing these small inspections. So I was by myself in the office. I was by myself in the car. I would work at home and I'd be by myself. And that's not good socially. You know, we are designed to be social creatures. 
And I take it as a blessing this day that from sitting and typing on a laptop um, over and over and over, I ended up with neck and migraines. So migraines aren't common in a 20 plus year old male. Uh, so my neighbor's dad was a chiropractor and she's like, go see this. They lived there from another town. She goes, go see this guy in, in Charleston. And I did. And I walked in and there was music bumping. There were people laughing. There were people running up and down the hallways. And just, it was just the most joyous experience you've ever had, I've ever had in a, in a healthcare clinic. And I was already thinking about going back and get my doctorate in either osteopathy or into uh, healthcare administration. Uh, we were looking at options with that. And then I just came home and I told my wife, it's like, I want to be a chiropractor. I want what this guy has. And, you know, I've modeled the essence of my clinic off of that kind of an environment. It's a place that people want to be, you know, they, they want to come in to heal, but you know, set and setting matters. And so you have to have the, the skills and the ability and the knowledge to help these patients, but you also have to have the environment, a, a loving, trustful environment where they can come in and actually, you know, uh, drop their bodies off or bring their souls in to, you know, to get some style of repair. Um, so we ended up um, moving out to Iowa, which for, for us, that's a 11 hour drive away from our home base and our families uh, because we wanted to go where the philosophy was true and where chiropractic had its origin. So we really honed in on that philosophy that the body heals. It's an above, down, inside out mechanism. My role is not to give you any artificial inputs, but it's merely there to remove interference. So you're born perfect. We just got to figure out where the little flaws are put something in, take something out and just let your body go back to doing the healing. You know, I love it. Environment, right? We're, we've been conditioned to go into a doctor's office and just sit there, be quiet and just patiently wait to be called upon, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour. Right. And, you know, there, there may be some elevator type music playing. Um, what can you explain to us what happens when somebody walks into your clinic? So I actually found out yesterday, I was picking my kids up from school and one of my long-term patients was there. She goes, do you know your front desk denied my daughter an appointment because she was one minute late? I was like, I didn't know that. Um, I'm not embarrassed by it. It was a matter that we run on schedule. So if somebody is scheduled at 940, they are seen at 940 because your time is valuable, right? If you're sitting there stressed out because you have to wait, then you're not in a state of healing. Mm -hmm. If uh, now every once in a while, there are cases where we have to, you know, run off a schedule, but we put blocks in time and our doctor's schedule so that we can catch up. And so we don't like anybody to wait more than five minutes. And if you're late, you're late. Um, you don't get seen, you get rescheduled. Because that's the kind of, that's the way I want, I would want to be seen. And mm -hmm. I would expect that anybody else, uh, their time is just as valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's, um, I, I love that idea. Uh, okay. I'm just going to spill a little bit here. Right. Kind of um, my experience is um, I just hate to beat up certain clinics. Right. But you, you get there and you just sit and you wait and you wait and then you wait some more. And I've had that same thought. Well, my time is valuable. Why am I just sitting here waiting? I just love the idea that you're you be on you're on time. You wait no more than five minutes, and you get into the, to the healing process much more quickly. That's so I I commend you for that. That's wonderful. Yeah, we're fortunate. Being in chiropractic, like we see our patients a lot more, a lot more often, and so I get to know them. You know, I know what their their mom is in the hospital with dementia, and now she's at home, and the you know so we get the opportunity to step into some roles almost as a friend, but still, you know, as a professional state. So when I'm in my, um, so I have different roles in the clinic, you know, so when I'm in my technician, doctor, chiropractor role, I stay true to that, but it's also these people, they've been with me for a long time. Um, I take, well, I don't take very many new patients right now uh, because I want to make sure that the people that have been with me for a long time have the highest level of care and access to what they need. Mm -hmm. You know, what just you thinking think? back, I, I had a chiropractor appointment this morning, actually, and um, the atmosphere that, that my chiropractor 
creates the one-on-one -on -one getting to know me, you know, finding out how things are going in my life. Um, you know, he knows what's going on with me. Even if I only see him once every month or once every two months, he clearly cares, right? And he's been a very big advocate. That that atmosphere, that level of caring, I think personally goes so far in helping me feel better about myself, where we're going with the treatments and, and just the healing process. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. That's uh, the empathy that we're trained at. I mean, that part of this is, you know, in the area where I am, chiropractic is not real well known. Like it, everybody has a medical doctor or has a primary care doctor, but not everybody has a chiropractor. But somewhere in Iowa, uh, parts of Illinois, you go to Nebraska, like you're going to the chiropractor first for most of your conditions and for prevention and before you're going to go the other way. So, you know, we've had to adapt as a profession. A lot of that is, you know, the more intimate setting with the patients. I mean, we're hands on. How many times do you get touched? I mean, how valuable is touch? I mean, right now, if you just think about somebody giving you a hug, you're going to become warm. I mean, just the smiles that showed up on your faces right now, and you could just feel it. Um, and there are patients that come in, you know, I give them a hug because I don't know when the last time they were touched. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at the at the very least, from a doctor's standpoint, like that helps them to relax. That helps them, you know, we I use a lot of instruments, but it still allows the muscle tension to reduce that so they're correction can um, set in and they can have long-term stability. What a yeah. concept. And I, the, I know every time I go to a doctor's office, my blood pressure, heart rate, even when I'm breathing uh, is elevated. And I actually will mention that when they're taking my readings. They're like, yeah, that's that's pretty common. So I can't imagine how helpful it is to actually go in at a relaxed state just ready to heal. So yeah, it's, it's you know, we have to do it in two steps. The first one is the clinical, you know, what are the clinical requirements for, you know, the visit? And it's, yeah, it's like having white coat syndrome. We acknowledge that people are going to have higher blood pressure, but then we actually use that before and after. So we have some treatments where we'll look at uh, like brainstem issues or kidney issues for blood pressure and we'll do interventions. And so we'll take the blood pressure multiple times and we can show, okay, this was white coat. This is your physiologic neutral state, and this is your new physiologic neutral state because you've had some therapies to uh, relax um, or take pressure off the areas that were messed up. Nice. When, you, when you're talking therapies, um, would you mind elaborating a little bit on, on what that means? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the tools that we have in the office, um, which I guess we should probably go over the like the pillars that I go over, right? Yeah. Because you know what? The foundation. Let me, can we hold that thought for just a second? Because we're on a topic here and I have a question around this. And, you know, from your perspective, um, the doctor patient relationship, um, what, what should that look like? And where I'm going, where, why I'm asking this is, I think so many times in, in Western medicine, um, which is, you know, maybe a little bit different than what we're talking about here, but there's a, a big separation between the doctor and the patient. At least that's my perception. Um, so what, what, is, what should that relationship look like? Um, and is there a point when you'd say to a patient or, you know, recommend a patient, maybe discontinue a relationship with a doctor? Well, I'll just leave it there. Well, uh, I mean, number one is ethics matter. And, uh, so you have to abide by professional standards in every single case, but, you know, the, the relationship between doctor and patient doesn't have to be this big, distant. Um, it doesn't have to be like, you know, I'm, I'm up here on a pedestal and you're not. That's not, you know, we're equals, right? We're, we work as a team to rebuild your health. And it's it's not uh, someone just giving. It's not just the doctor providing. In, and this is kind of the, the, the philosophical differences between different healthcare um side. So, you know, from a chiropractic side, it's the person does the healing and it's an internal healing process. And my job is to remove something that's inhibiting that. And um, so in more of a medical side, it's that you need external influences to make a shift. Um, and so that's really like, they need to really force an intervention, whether it's a uh, in the pharmaceutical or surgery or, or whatever, you know, it's, it's absolutely necessary and there's just different approaches to it, but being from the standpoint where the, the person is designed to heal and they're going to heal, um, 
you know, that relationship can be a little bit more, I want to say intimate, but really what I mean is more hands-on, a closer touch and getting to know the person a lot more because, you know, you, you, you should see them at least a lot more. So we know where their, where their um, problem points are and where it shows up in their structure. Nice. You know, um, absolutely agree. Right. And just a little bit of history here before we move into the five pillars, because I want to get there very quickly, but as a point, as, as, as a story here to illustrate your point, um, I had gone to typical Western medicine doctors for quite a while, had a number of issues that I've talked about before on the podcast, Lyme disease turned out type two diabetes, um, didn't quite catch those things. Uh, I'm going to a regular doctor. I went to a, a DO. Um, we did, um, uh, goodness gracious, I can't think of the term right now. Um, kinesiology. Uh, kinesiology. There you are. Thank you. Um, and in a very short period of time, we were so dialed in and it was a co-creative experience um, they provided the insight and the, the knowledge and, you know, they supported me along on that journey. So that, that's kind of where, um, where my viewpoint is, is that that relationship is extremely powerful. So, right. So, uh, osteopathy and chiropractic grew out about the same time in the late 1800s, around the 1890s. And they both grew out of vitalism, which was a, in some ways it was a religious uh, movement, but in other ways it was more about just realizing that everything has an essence or an energy field to it. So uh, osteopathy then transitioned into the medical set. So, you know, the fact that your uh, DO is doing kinesiology and testing your body systems fits right in with traditional osteop osteopathic medicine or osteop osteopathy before it was osteopathic medicine. Um, and so your body will give the information. It, it has all this knowledge and you just have to ask the right questions and you can at the very least tease out areas to go look for to do your further studies so you can refine and refine and, and figure out and identify where the problems really are. Nice. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, well, let's move into the five pillars because I, 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 this is just amazing stuff. So why don't we just jump right into it and I'll let you go for it. So we talk about holistic health and part of that is looking at somebody on multiple planes. Um, where, you know, sometimes you go to a, a doctor and they look at one thing or they specialize. Specialization, it tends to be the, the trend nowadays. But, you know, if you get, so, if you can be looked at from a structure and energy and emotion and nutrition and a neurology standpoint, you have a lot of, um, you've, you've gotten a really good assessment. And I can break those down into, you know, structure is what you would think of just the, the spinal framework and joints movements. Uh, energy, I kind of break that down into two versions. One's going to be your mitochondrial energy. So what you need to, to run for the day. So when you had Lyme disease, you know, you're running low on energy and you're fatigued all the time. The other one's kind of like the woo energy. And um, in some ways, that's like what we use for acupuncture to open up energetic channels that run through your body and different states that you have there. Uh, nutrition is what I, I use to broadly term any kind of biochemical changes. So that's where we can look at labs. We can look at genetic studies to figure out where stuff isn't... Um, probably optimized, right? And then we go into um, emotion. And so again, like with emotion, your body will give clues as to where you're holding the stress. So there's some real specific points in the body. Like if you're always um, rubbing your temples, well, that's a, a sphenoid, it's a, it's a bone, but that's one of the big triggers for high stress areas. There's a point in the mid back about T5, which is a high emotional stress point. So I, I relate those in with emotional stress. And then as I've learned more and studied more with this consciousness, it's moving, you know, energy and your, your consciousness around to uh, adjust and adapt and let go of emotions that have been there. And then finally, the neurology, which has been one of the most exciting areas for me. Um, I really love this cervical cranial junction. That's where the top of the neck and the head come together. To me, there's nothing more intimate on a person than, than getting to release the tension that is stuck there. And it's so critical because that's the area where your brainstem is. Um, well, not to mention you have a 12 pound bowling ball sitting on a little two ounce <laughs> bone with 490 degree turns of the vertebral artery before it goes up and feeds the back half of the brain and the cranial nerves. There's a lot of, there's a lot of delicate structures up there. And then you have your brainstem, which, you know, from a neurodevelopmental standpoint that controls your respiration, digestion, perspiration, circulation, all those body functions you don't think about on top of your motor patterns that you were born with. 
So your programming coming out of the womb is stored in this really delicate area at the base of the skull on the top of the neck. And um, if those aren't developed properly, then your posture reflexes don't develop properly. If that doesn't, well, then you end up with um, a functional disconnection disorder where your the right and the left hemisphere of the brain don't operate, executive function drops down. And so if we talk about being able to be really good at global, um, you know, global thoughts or really good as an engineer in the technical side, and you're having issues or attention issues, we want to go and look at the function, especially of the brainstem function. When I think about energy and vitality, I think about a kid. They have the energy to play, run around, climb things. That energy that feels like you just can't contain yourself. It's the stuff we've always wished they could just bottle up and sell to us, right? Well, this company's found a way to do just that. Amari's Happy Juice Pack. Mood, motivation, energy, things our bodies can naturally produce when both our guts and our brains are happy and communicating. And we can actually improve that process of communication across the axis of the gut and the brain. This is cutting edge science. This is game changing information. This is where science meets soul. This is Amare. And we're helping people feel better naturally. Check out the links in the show notes for discounts and more information. How much of, of that function right there, uh, the neurology of it, would you say plays into or could play into um, things like ADD and ADHD? So it's it's uh, all of it, uh, pretty much all of it, uh, because a lot of it is it's a functional disconnection syndrome. Dr. Uh, Robert Melillo, I've uh, been studying his work for years. The guy, the guy is a genius. And what we look at is right and left hemispheric imbalance. And a lot of that develops because you didn't go through and integrate your primitive reflexes properly. So some of those, we think about it, like if uh, you touch the side of your face uh, in a baby, their cheek will go up to breastfeed, right? Or you turn their head, the arm will bend so they can come out of the womb, right? Or um, so we had, there's several of these reflexes. A lot of people know it, like the one you, you scrape the bottom of the, the foot and the big toe will flare up, right? These are meant to help you get out of the womb and to help you feed for the first couple months. And then after the first four to six months, most of those should integrate. And so then we should go into some postural reflexes. And that would be something as simple as when a baby falls, their arms go up. So anytime you drop a baby back, their arms always go up. But when an adult falls, if their arms go up, they're going to get concussions over and over. So their arms should go out to catch themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just this reflex that should integrate without much thought, but it has to be done se sequentially. So if a baby misses certain milestones in their development, let's say they walk before their age one, well, they've, they've missed out on um, integrating like the, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, right? So the arm is going to keep bending. And so when you find somebody with hundred percent of the time, um, you find somebody with attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder or autism, they're going to have primitive reflexes. And as you integrate those primitive reflexes, the brains, uh, the two hemispheres of the brain start connecting to each other. And then that disconnection goes away. So then you don't have one lobe resonating at really high, you know, let's say it's talking at 12 Hertz and the other one's talking at 10 Hertz. Well, I mean, I'd be screaming really loud too, looking for attention if, you know, my partner couldn't hear me all the time. And so as you do the inputs from the bottom up, um, and, and there's other things involved, right? We have this primitive, we have the posture, we have core strength. So if you look at kids now and they have like really atrocious handwriting and they have no stability, well, how is your brain supposed to function if your core is weak and you're wobbly all the time? And then because your vestibular system that causes you to balance is off. And then your oculomotor system has to work overtime because now you're all wobbly. And so now your ocular motor, meaning your eye, your eye controls, uh, it just has to balance out with the balance systems in your ears. Now that's all working overtime just for you to exist and be and just have basic rudimentary functions in life. So how are you supposed to be expected to make these higher levels of consciousness and education and mentalization if you can't even do the basic stabilization? Mm -hmm. 
So is this uh, what you're talking about considered the brain body connection? Yeah, that's 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 the point where it all comes together. Yeah, a lot of the inputs that the, that a lot of these um, we were called functional neurologists. Uh, you'll look at the eye, the um, ocular motor system. So you'll do some graphics of the eyes and, and video that and see where uh, those movement patterns go off or some of it's going to be vestibular system. So we'll look at different parts of the, of the balance. Uh, but my approach is I always start with the primitive reflexes. I go to the most basic level and then work my way up. Uh, in fact, before I even go to those that neurology, I go to the structure and I address the misalignment between the C1 vertebra, the top part of the vertebra, to the cranium. And interestingly enough, I have found primitive reflexes go away with that. I found, um, you know, typical conditions that we think of for chiropractors, migraines, headaches, those go away. But I've also had experiences where, where things, you get the blood supply going back and tinnitus can decrease. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a fix for everything, but it's a heck of a good starting point. Wow. And is, is this, is this something that most chiropractors would have in there as part of their practice, or is this a specialty for you? This is a specialty. I mean, the, the upper cervical care, which is what this, the one I technique I do is Atlas orthogonal. There's other ones. That's a specialty technique within chiropractic. And then the um, neurodevelopmental child neurodevelopmental work is also a fellowship. So it's a postgraduate um, certification that you get after, uh, if you've been to chiropractic school and some doctors, it, you know, there's specializations in chiropractic, just like there is in medicine or any other field. And, uh, you have to want to learn this, you know, in my case, I had a, a child that needed some help and I have some experience in, in neurology, but I knew he needed a little bit more. And so I just kind of jumped in and, you know, did that to help him and, and realized where, how many other people need it. Yeah. So we talked about ADD, ADHD, autism. How else could a disconnection or imbalance with the brain body connection manifest for people? You know, on a, on a less, uh, I would say dramatic scale in some ways would be some people like just don't sense their body real well. Right. And this would, you know, an example would be a, uh, you know, a middle-aged female who goes to the gym and deadlifts 350 pounds. Right. Because at some point in her life, she's disconnected from her body. And so what you'll do is you'll go to the point where your joints are damaged or at the verge of being damaged to get that sensation of stimulation, right? Versus just sitting here. And um, so I, you know, I even ask, I ask a lot of people and, and it would be, okay, you're sitting in your car driving right now, or you're sitting at your desk. Can you feel what your left butt cheek is doing? You know, can you feel... Okay, where your foot is on the ground, like where's your little toe on your right foot? Can you feel it? And some people can, some people can't. Like, what's your heart rate right now? Do you have that proprioception or sense of where your body is in space? Or have you purposely, you know, downregulated it? And, um, you know, if you, if you look at like some like endurance athletes, like they disconnect from their bodies because they're out running 30 miles or 100 miles and, uh, you know, I've done that myself and I'm in my body and it's, uh, that's a painful thing to do when you're in your body, uh, <laughs> that much, but, uh, it, it, a lot of people, the, the, when you see people doing stuff that pushes them to their limits, it's because they're disconnected and it could be anything from exercise. It could be to eating. So that area is crucial for, I'm telling you for overall health of our, our, our people as a society. I'm curious, is there a way, is it healthy to have, to be able to disconnect and then is it easy or is there a way to easily reconnect? Um, if, if you've, if you got training in this area, like you've deliberately taken the time to understand this and, and worked with, you know, your feeling, um, is it healthy to ever disconnect? Um, or should you always be in a state of connection? I think the disconnection comes from periods of trauma. So whether it was, you know, a childhood trauma and you just grew up without having the sensation of your body or it was something as an adult, whether it would be um, usually some uh, tra acute traumatic event, not so much as a chronic traumatic event. 
So there's advantages to that because sometimes it would be overwhelming. Your nervous system is going to shut down. And because if you're sending a, a constant negative signal to the brain over and over and over, well, uh, I, I talk about the spine like fuses, right? So, or breakers in your house, right? So if we have if we have a, a sink filled up and we have a toaster beside it and the toaster's plugged in and you just happen to drop the toaster off, the breaker's gonna pop in the house, right? But if you have a huge surge, you know, a, a lightning bolt, you know, hits the house, the main line is gonna pop. So it depends on where we need to, um, or where the body feels like it's necessary to reduce the that signaling coming up. And so some of this is like um, the if you if you go to the chiropractor and you have to go over and over and over and over and this is years out. Well, you didn't address the the underlying cause of where it came from, right? And so part of that is is figuring it out. So in order to do the repair, you just go back to day zero when you're born, right? And you go through okay, what is the motor pattern or the movement pattern, the the primitive reflexes? So we just test that. And we see where those are. And then we go to some posture reflexes and we test that. We look for where the breakdowns are. And there will always be a breakdown in one of those if there's this big functional disconnection. So what causes the disconnect? Is it always a, an environmental input? Could it be a genetic thing? Uh, you know, with with some of it is going to be genetic and that's going to be just what it is. Like, we're not going to be able to make a change to that to some degree. Um, a lot of it is environmental. So it's the epigenetic switches that turned on and off because of external influences. Um, and a lot of times people either don't have the memory or don't want to access the memory or, you know, it's been buried and it's uh, it's just a traumatic event that maybe just doesn't need to be brought up to do the healing. Nice. I've heard more and more about talking about people not having to go relive that trauma and re-experience it to heal. Uh, are there, what are some other ways? Or is it just the energy work, breath? Where would you start somebody in that position? I mean, I just start with the way I always start, which is I go, I look at the structure first, do a brief exam or not brief. I do a detailed exam on the structure and then usually fix that, that top vertebra. Then I just go into the neurology side of stuff and then I'll go into an acupuncture assessment. Um, and so we can do a lot of people do pulses and tongues. Um, uh, some people just have a, a gift to kind of like feel different energy points. And, um, you know, I have a little bit of that. I, I definitely can would love to develop that even further. Um, so part of that is, uh, also, you know, just watching somebody move, right? Their movement, if you're really articulate with somebody's movement, you can watch and see, okay, stand on one leg. Well, do they clench their jaw? So now we know that there's some inputs going to that because they have some instabilities in certain places or they hold their breath. Well, and then we got to look to see if that's an emotional piece because of, you know, some physical trauma. Um, does their left butt, you know, does their, their left hip extend? Is their buttock is activated? No. Well, where's that coming from? Where's that weakness? You know, um, so it, part of it is just watching, observing, and then seeing where the breakdown occurs. And then, you know, we add studies in on top of that with the, the biochemical studies to see, well, okay, it looks like your, your chloride's down. What's going on with your kidneys? And is that referring out? Is that something else we need to look at? Mm -hmm. How important do you, well, we know there's importance here, but how much would you associate our nutrition to all of this? Or the Nutrition body? is, yeah, it's important. Um, and I think a lot of people do nutrition wrong, right? Because anything you put in your system either helps you or hurts you. So, you know, I have patients that are, you know, that do this and they go on and they buy something off of a website and they're like, here, I started taking this. And I look at them and I'm just like, how do you know you need that? Like, what test did you do to figure out that that's something your system needs? Um, so when I look at nutrition, I usually go from genomics. So we look at, we have all these detailed panels. So we know we have to look at the nutrition and supplementation. And then I put it up side by side with the set of labs, especially it looks at a comprehensive metabolic panel. Uh, so 
I can see, well, you know, you are in vitamin D and, and you know, this detailed uh, cholesterol panel. So I can see, well, you need omega-3s. You've been eating, you know, I look at their diet as well. You've been eating like garbage. Now you're, you're uh, very, you may have the best HDL number in the world, but if it's small and dense, it's going to stick to the arteries and it's going to be as bad for you. It's going to be worse for you than having a lot of big fluffy LDLs. So it's kind of like knowing those details with their genetics and then being able to refine their diet. But the beauty with a genomics based diet is once you have it, you have it, it doesn't change. Like once we know what you need to eat, that's it. Like that's what you need to eat for life. Once we know basically what supplements you need to be on, that's where your body breaks down and that's what it needs fed, right? So we can usually find the one multivitamin that somebody can stay on for life or their one fish oil that they can tolerate, but usually, you know, based off of their genomics, we can figure out which one that would be. And then you just give them a little bit of time to make the epigenetic changes. And um, the, the nutrition side of it will help somebody heal. It's not, it's not going to make them heal directly by itself. Right. And that's, um, so like a lot of people, who, and I'm trying to bash on any kind of profession here, but like some, um, functional medicine. Like I have, I have my certificate in functional medicine, but a lot of that is also still in my mind, it's still under like the medical model, which is we do a lot of testing. We figure out where something is wrong and we force supplements instead of medications into your system um, without kind of going in and figuring out, well, maybe we'll just have a little bit of a deficiency here. And we're going to let a course correct over time. Uh, now, when you talk about something with Lyme disease, yeah, functional medicine is absolutely amazing for some of these chronic health um, but more importantly than nutrition is sleep. If somebody does not sleep, their brain and their body cannot heal. And, you know, part of the prerequisites for my, my clients are, you know, seven hours of sleep minimum. And then whatever your genomics say, you have to do that. If not, don't even bother coming back. Like, you know, here's your refund, get out the door. Because I don't want to, I don't want to be associated with somebody that can't put enough time into sleep to heal their system, because you're not going to get better. Yeah, there's a level of um, personal responsibility that that comes into play here, right? And um, you know, no matter who it is we've talked to from the performance world, sleep is always the the first thing that they go to. Um, the performance boost or just the the leveling up of performance from quality and enough sleep is just amazing. You know, I find this just to be really fascinating. This is a complete paradigm shift from what I think most Americans um, see or think about when they think about nutrition and diet is they go from this diet to that diet, hoping to find the thing that will keep them lean. Um, and maybe the model's all wrong. Maybe we're just looking at this wrong altogether. The the true way maybe is is the uh the testing the genetic testing right and um once you get that dialed in it sounds to me like that you're saying that it's it's a lot easier to get healthy and stay healthy once we know exactly what it is we need to eat and so is is this type of testing um accessible to most most americans um is this something that's a little bit out of reach for most people uh no, the, recently, a lot of that's become accessible to almost everybody. Um, in order to do it, I would think, in order to do it properly, you need to work with a coach that has been through training with the genomics. Uh, because if not, there's a lot of information. Like I did the 23andMe, and you know, at, at, when it first came out, I was floored by the information that came out of it. But how much of it was actionable, right? So information means nothing if you don't have um, an actionable or a treatment that goes with it. So you need somebody that's knowledgeable with it to be able to, to say, okay, let's put this data in that. Now, over the next few months, uh, we're going to see some AI driven genomic um, panels come out, which will help with uh, direct to consumer um, interpretation, but it's still at this point is not going to replace what a doctor or a coach, you know, a really well-trained coach is going to be able to provide for that. Nice. Um, I want to circle back for a minute here. Um, when we're talking about primitive reflexes, um, what indicators would you recommend um, a new parent look for? I mean, I think you mentioned a couple, but are there um, 
standard developmental points or ages along along the developmental path that they can be looking for these things at? Yeah, in, in fact, I encourage everybody to get a copy of Dr. Melillo's book because it just lays it out there and it actually shows parents how to do some of the testing with their kid. Yeah, there's you can grab a chart and and or a lot of occupational therapists will will know this as well. They have those um, so it's they have those dialed in pretty well. So it's worth an evaluation at one year. Now some pediatricians will do it, but if you know your child's not walking at exactly one year of age, that's if they're late or they're early, there's something going on there. So that's a really easy marker for most people to look at. If they always turn their head and their elbow always bends and it's past six months, yeah, that's something that they you need to look at. If your child has really atrocious balance as like a toddler and they fall over really easy and not just like normal toddler fall over, but that's an issue. If your two-year-old didn't go through the terrible twos, yeah, that's not, that's not right either because at the two-year-old, you go from using primarily your right brain to a left brain. Um, left hemisphere dominance. So you should have emotional uh, outbursts at that age. That's, that's part of normal development. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it, then as you get older, and then you start having the primitive reflex training, you're going to go through it later. It's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's, I do have ADHD. And I have found, you know, the first thing most doctors go to is meds, stimulants, uh, and, you know, I could talk most of the day about the negative effects that I get from stuff like that. And uh, what other ways can you go about helping with that? Well, here's the thing with, with medications. For the most part, they globally affect the brain up or down, right? And it's not a global issue. It's a hemispheric issue that requires specificity to approach it. So if we're taking uh, Adderall or something to speed the brain up, well, if you're, most people uh, that I come across, left brain is usually the one that's uh, very dominant and the right side's a little underperforming. And so now we just took a medication that speeds up the left brain and the left brain's already going faster than the right. And so, you know, we talked about being uh, two Hertz off and now they're still two Hertz off. They're just going a lot more wild. Uh, so if you look at any of the, the medications historically, they help for about two to three months. And then after that, the period of it, uh, the effectiveness kind of wanes off because it didn't fix the underlying issue. And so the, I mean, the only thing, and this is like Harvard based studies, like there's research out there that's proven that this is effective over and over and over again, is finding where the primitive reflexes occurred, figuring out which side is weak and doing everything you can to strengthen up the other side until it balances out. I guess I'm unfamiliar with this. Uh, maybe uh, you could talk about what the left and right side of the brain do, you know, overall view. Overall view. So the left hemisphere is going to control the right side of the body and the right hemisphere is going to control the left side of the body. Um, basically the face is going to be controlled on the same side right? The right side of the brain is going to be at, at birth until about two years old. It gives you your big global picture of life. So it takes everything in and the right brain knows that there's more information out there than what it can process. And it knows there's a whole world. Your left brain gets all of this information from the right brain and it's your technical specific side of things. So a lot of, you know, if you're your left brain dominant, your view of the world feels like it's whole and complete but you're only getting information passed through from the right hemisphere, which knows that there's, because all the right is asking is, is asking for your accountant to give me some numbers and input the risk and tell me the backside, you know, tell me the back and you control whatever little part you need. So if the, the accountant side of your brain thinks it has all the information, it's not a CEO, right? You can't have an accountant telling the workers what to do because they're only going to run off of efficiency of numbers. They're not going to go, well, that person also has a wife. They also have to take a break, right? So you, you, you have this lack of global view in a lot of the, the, the times. I could definitely see where the lack of focus and people having issues with their, um, you know, spontaneity, getting them into trouble, not being able to see that bigger picture and 
beyond. Yeah. Now, historically, there's been a lot of benefit to that as, as a society, right? So all of our scientific advancements came from individuals that had brain dysfunction. And so they got to use uh, areas of their brain like um, so, so like Einstein, his strength in his brain was his ability for uh, visual spatial. So he could take objects up and see it and rotate it in his head better than anybody else and see all the sides of it. I think it was Broadman Area 43 is where he had um, uh, a lot of strength. And so, you know, there was a lot of advantages to that. But because uh, I, I don't know what the exact cause is, but I'm going to say because of changes in diet and probably a lot of it's in exercise and playtime that kids have, that we don't have that full full development um, cycle that goes through and then we end up with a little bit more left brain. And, you know, for the most part, if, um, uh, if a patient or a person does have ADD or ADHD or OCD or, um, you know, you're going to look and one of the parents is going to be close. We call it falling off the cliff. The, the child's going to fall off the cliff, but the parent's really close to the cliff if they're not falling off, falling off themselves, right? So they're, you know, their their dad's an engineer and a scientist and doesn't even acknowledge that there's anything wrong because the kid is freaky smart in school and getting straight A's. But in reality, that kid also hasn't like can't can't draw, you know, doesn't have a rhythm, it lacks coordination. Sports is really clumsy, right? So that you've traded one gift for the other, but in, you've also lost um, full function of one hemisphere of your brain. Wow, just described part of my life right there. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's I mean, it is so fascinating. I have this this wonderful patient. I just love her to death, and uh, she's she's um, she has Downs and autism, wow. and so we talk about the, the one of the most difficult cases because you know, syndromic or genetic uh, issues don't always respond as well as somebody that's, that's not. But one of the things she had is she would be in a car and she was, oh, she's about six years old, still in diapers uh, because she couldn't sense her body. So we talk about how do you sense your body? She was still in diapers and then she would take her cup and I don't even want to do this, but she would take her cup and when she was in the backseat of the car and then when she drank, she could get it from the cup holder to her mouth, and then she just put it out in the air and just drop it. Because to her, she doesn't have proprioception. She didn't know where the cup came from. She saw it and she could grab it, but she didn't know it needed to go back there. Right. So I worked with her just um, intermittently for about four months. And, you know, in that short period of time, by integrating some of these primitive reflexes, like she got back into her body, like she was in back in, in regular underpants going to preschool or kindergarten um, with no problem. Um, in fact, I even checked in with the uh, the school counselor there. We had a nice detailed conversation on that. And then she would, when she comes into the clinic now, and they drive, I mean, they drive a good distance to come down. Um, she's, she has her cup with her. So she's she's been drinking along the way, sitting in her cup holder, and, and then been drinking her cup when she comes in. Now she's nonverbal autistic. So like that's even, you know, it's even higher on the spectrum. But in order to see, you know, in a case like like that worst case scenario, and now this child can, is back in her body, she's present, and she has better brain body communication. Like the quality of her life has gone up exponentially, just by finding out where those weaknesses are and repairing them. That is incredible. Wow. Uh, do you, you know, I've read recently that there's belief that our electronics, you know, the use of phones, TVs, babysitting, you know, children, that that actually will play into some of these issues. Do you think there's any truth behind that? I don't know. Uh, that's one I don't know. The only thing I've ever done is I've looked at the studies and I look at studies that show that people that live in an area with a certain level of ionizing radiation actually live longer. It's called use stress, right? So we need certain levels of stress for or to optimize our longevity because if everything's nice and plush and lush and we don't have little stressors around us we're going to procreate a lot faster make a lot more offspring and we're going to die earlier it's just it's just the nature of things but as a person encounters more stress um, they're going to be harder um, so they're going to have more longevity markers with them. So as long as you don't go past that threshold from use stress to 
really terrible stress, then I, um, I don't know, you know, I think that's it. If we talk about from, you know, 5G and all that, I just don't know. Um, I have my cell phone sitting right next to me. So, you know, I'm on a computer. I sit on a computer all day. I have electronic equipment. You know, it's the thing. I love medical devices. Uh, I do a lot of testing. And if somebody was going to get fried, then I know I'd definitely be one of the guys there. I worked in a power plant. I was right next to the generators. Like, you know, if there were significant risks with, with a lot of this, you know, we would see huge cancer rates in people that work at power plants, especially where I am, where they're coal fired power plants. You know, we would see, uh, I think we would just, I think we would see some changes. Now that, that being said, two hours from where I, I live, there's um, a national telescope. And so it's a cell phone free zone for a couple uh, counties. And so we have people that move there so they don't have EMF or they have less EMF. So people still have landlines, computers still have, uh, you know, have to be plugged into the wall. You're not allowed to have Wi-Fi because it interfered with reception there. So, you know, I know there's some people that are sensitive to it, but you have to look at the uh, parathyroid gland in that case and see if that's functioning properly or not. And from a standpoint of, um, I think what I was reading is because the, you know, our, the rate of, so how do I say that? Um, from the way TV has come, you know, it used to be really slow changes in scenes and, you know, it'd be focused on one scene for a long time and then switch. But, you know, now with technology increasing, it's, flashes of light stimulation to the brain and just all this input and it what i read was it was changing how our brain actually receives information and makes us think and move to things faster yeah it the the inputs you know television and movies have it down to a science on how much screen changes you can have and i don't know what those numbers are if it's a third of a second or a fifth of a second I know when my my boys are watching TV, like it's high pitch laughs, and I'm my office is next to our living room, so they you know they they get some time on TV. It's high pitch laughs, it squeals, and it's flickering lights all the time. Uh, so we limit the exposure to that. You know they you know when I pick them up from school or their mom picks them up from school, we're outside playing, we're getting natural sunlight, we're doing all the things to balance out the effects of that. Is uh, you know, when we, when we pick out movies, like recently, I love The Mandalorian because they're slow scenes. It's a story. It's not a gotcha. It's not a, an emotional show, but it's one of those that's just, it's a story to, to experience and enjoy, right? And the colors are muted. So, you know, my boys are a little bored with it, but on the other hand, if they can just get them to sit down for a minute, well, you know, part of it's just like, oh, this is just nice and relaxing experience. Going from that, you know, we're we're in that, and we're also watching Iron Man three. So it's a matter of, <laughs> you know, depending on how tired they are for the night and how much stimulus they can take, is kind of like what we choose. You know, what we're going to spend the last um, hour of our time together at night. Nice. You know, I wanted to um, allow some time here to talk about, you know what you offer in your practice. I know you've touched on a lot of things, but if you could kind of bring it all home for us and, um, you know, as part of, you know, being on the podcast, we love to share with our audience, you know, where people can go to find out what you do and, and to work with you. So if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about um, some of the the offerings that you have in your clinic, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, I have a, I have a, a lot of offerings in my clinic. So we offer, um, I, I have me, I have two chiropractic associates and I have a physical therapist and I have an occupational health manager. So we offer a chiropractic acupuncture. Um, I have to call it clinical nutrition. I can't call it functional medicine. Um, so we have that, we have, uh, genetics, um, the nutrition side of things. We have physical therapy. I have an occupational health company. Um, but for people that come out of town, I have programs. So we look at these really detailed, oh, I also have the neurodevelopmental work. Um, so we approach everything from the structure, energy, motion, nutrition, all in one shot. Um, 
So we have uh, two different websites. It's like enlivenwv.com and the other one is enbrain, E-N-B-R-A-I-N dot health. Um, and so for people that, you know, if they ever come from out of town, uh, we do detailed, detailed assessments that all, all the panels, we do the labs, we do the genomics, I do the neurology testing, we do the physical testing, the, bio, the body composition testing um, in order to figure out uh, on top of other things that we're looking at with EKGs, EQ, you know, pulmonary function tests. Like I just, I like to look at somebody from head to toe and every visceral system that's out there so I can see where the breakdown is and see, do they need the help that I can provide or the help where they can go get somewhere else? Um, so it's just, it's just a way to, to look at our patients and our clients uh, in this very holistic approach. Um, when, when folks come in from out of town to work with you, is there like a, a time frame that they should block out for this trip? So usually, you know, we can do a, an assessment and a detailed assessment in the first half day. It's just test after test after test. Uh, and then over lunchtime, I usually can analyze a lot of the data together. And then I usually spend the next two days doing uh, the first one is going to be like, you know, passive treatment. So let's, let me just get you better. Right. Mm -hmm. and the next day is let me show you what you can do to make you better. So let me, you're going to be actively. And then that evening is you show me that, you know, this stuff. And then the last time is any kind of uh, polishing and finishing work that somebody needs. So part of it's doing the correction there is part of it's doing, um, giving them the tools and the strategies to fix themselves at home. And if, they need more work, they're welcome to stay longer, um, but it just depends. It's case by case. I don't have a set cookie cutter plan because boy, everybody brings their own unique stuff that needs addressed. Yes, thank you um, for having that approach. That is, I think, in, in my experience, non-medical experience, this experience as a, as a, as a patient, that is invaluable. Um, not just treating me as, as a, a number is great. So thank you for doing that. Um, what did we miss? Did we miss anything? Is there something, anything else that we, we should be talking about here that we haven't touched on today? Um, I think we caught on most of it, which is, you know, the head's supposed to fit over the body perfectly square. The brain is supposed to coordinate to the body and its fullest extent. And then your biochemistry is meant to self-balance right after that. Beautiful. Nice. Thank you so much. I love this holistic integrated approach and not only that, just the individual approach to the patient and taking the time to consider their needs as a separate body, <laughs> not just part of the masses. A lot of people just need to be heard. They need somebody to know what their problem is. And, um, you know, maybe not the, the story behind it isn't important, but where you are now and what we can do to fix it is the most important thing. And just knowing that there is an option to get better with the assistance of somebody or on your own just means the world. You know, I think I, I totally forgot to ask, where are you located? <laughs> I'm located in, it's in Bridgeport, West Virginia. We're about 90 miles south of Pittsburgh. Okay. So we have beautiful hills. You have mountains behind you. We have gorgeous hills that I go and explore every weekend. Beautiful. We, that's one of our favorite things to do. Awesome. Well, friends, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to our podcast today. We appreciate you. Um, you can find out more about what we do, um, how we help, help people get unstuck and feel better and thrive in these challenging times at our Five Mountain Coaching website. That's the number five, then mountaincoaching.com. And... Dr. Jim is going to let us know what his um, website is. We'll also have the links in the, in the show notes. It is enbrain.health, E-N-B-R-A-I-N.health. And my uh, chiropractic clinic is enlivenwv.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you.